the United States being forced to acknowledge changes in West Asia over the last many months that seemed apparent at three recent events in Saudi Arabia attended by top U.S. officials. After Balloon Gate, the United States media is talking about a China-Cuba spying arrangements of sorts. Well, it all sounds very sensational. Is it really true since everybody involved seems to have denied it outright, including U.S. officials? A new health warning about the dangers of ultra-processed foods, especially for infants and very young children in the U.K. is out. And we'll talk about this along with warnings about sugar substitutes from the WHO. Welcome back to Daily Debrief and we'll be talking about these three issues today. The Gulf Cooperation Council members and the United States released a joint statement on June 8. It refers to numerous sensitive issues related to the region. But the fine print talks about, for example, protecting Syria's unity and sovereignty, even as it also reaffirms support for U.S. and coalition forces. Is some of the changing language a result of Saudi Arabia, the United States' top ally in the region, charting a more independent path, especially since the Ukraine war? We'll talk to Abdul from People's Dispatch about the signals from these discussions in the context of recent developments. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Abdul, what are the three recent events and what is their significance? Well, uh, Anthony Blinken uh, visited Saudi Arabia and met uh, Prince, uh, uh, Crown Prince Salman. Apart from that, he also attended the GCC me Foreign Minister's meeting. And then he, at the end of it, of his three-day summit, he also attended a meeting of global uh, alliance against, uh, for the fight against ISIS. So these are the three events which basically club, clubbed together, basically sums up the Blinken's three days uh, in Saudi Arabia. The, the, the visit, basically, though the, these meetings were uh, lined up, but the visit and the timing of it is very crucial, primarily because, the growing, uh, because of the growing speculations in the global politics about, as you rightly pointed out, Saudi Arabia's uh, independence, uh, attempts to basically assert its independence, its autonomy, autonomous autonomy in the foreign policy, in the regional policy, and so on and so forth, and uh, 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 hints that this assertion of autonomy leads towards uh, basically uh, uh, Saudi Arabia moving away right. from the, uh, la, uh, the uh, hegemonic uh, US uh, umbrella, uh, which has been the case for last more than uh, five or six decades. So given in that, uh, the and Blinken's visit to Saudi Arabia and attending these meetings is uh, more important in this particular context. Right, Abdul. Abdul, now let's come to Iran. While the statement might say that they're happy to see Saudi Arabia and Iran forge new diplomatic ties, but is the JCPOA, the nuclear issue, actually going to continue to continue the way it has so far? Well, the, if you see the joint statement, they of course mention about the NPT, they talk about how uh, there is, should be uh, countries following the uh, international laws, UN right. Charter and so on and so forth. But uh, it is a well-known fact that it is not the Iran which basically withdrew from the JCPOA. It is the US which unilaterally withdrew from the uh, six-party uh, agreement. And it has, US has the responsibility to uh, basically initiate the process of rejoining it while removing the sanctions against Iran and right. so on and so forth. But the, the most important part uh, 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 when, is, when we see the joint statement is how uh, Saudi, uh, sorry, uh, US has basically forced, it seems there is a um, change in US stance on Saudi-Iran uh, rapprochement, which uh, if you see the initial statements, they were very cautious about welcoming it or kind of uh, giving their assent to it. But it seems now they are wholeheartedly, it, as if you read the statement, it seems they are quite okay with it. Uh, uh, of course, there are issues, uh, um, uh, there are outstanding issues like maritime security and so on and so forth. But the normalization of relations between the countries in the region is a welcome step, step and so on and so forth. It seems Blinken had conceded that. More interesting uh, 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 than Iran is the, uh, the overall stand on Palestine and the uh, Israel's uh, sorry Saudi uh, uh, Saudi the issue of Saudi Arabia normalizing its relationship 
with, with Israel. Israel. Right. That was uh, before Blinken started his trip to uh, Saudi Arabia. In the in an IPEC meeting, he asserted that that is going to be its priority, the U.S. priority to basically attempt and create the normalization between uh, U.S. sorry between Saudi Arabia and Israel. But if you see the joint statement and if you uh, if you if you saw this press state uh, press conference which happened after yesterday's meeting, uh, seems that both the foreign ministers are not on the same page, and their uh, the speculations which were earlier made in different media uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia is bargaining for recognition of its nuclear program, assistance mm -hmm. from U.S. in return of its normalization mm -hmm. of relation with Israel is is not the case. And uh, it seems that Saudi Arabia has taken a firm stand that normalization will only happen if there is any development on the two-state solution. So that is a quite, uh, I think, is if you see it in the context, it's a big blow for uh, uh, the larger agenda with which Blinken went to uh, Saudi Arabia and the overall uh, context in which the Saudi and US relationships are work is working out. All right, Abdul, thanks for joining us. And you know, we'll be back with you in just another minute with our next segment. Media reports are talking about the China-Cuba deal that will have China monitor electronic communications in the Caribbean and Latin America. But there are strong suspicions it is feeding into the narrative about Cuba as a threat to the United States and that it will only support the U.S. maintaining its sanctions against the country. We return to Abdul who's been tracking this issue. Abdul, I don't want to make light of this issue, but is it through balloons that China is going to monitor communications in that area? Well, uh, thankfully, the U.S. officially has uh, refuted the, uh, the report, saying that this is, of course, not true. But I think here we should uh, see the report and, and, and uh, see that, that despite the claims made by the U.S. that the report is completely uh, false and not true, there is a partial uh, truth in the report, if you see. The report in the Wall Street Journal recognizes that, that the U.S. is cons constantly uh, uh, trying to uh, make uh, military buildups and intelligence buildups in and around China. Uh, uh, it basically uh, does military exercises in the South China Sea, sea and uh, basically its policies towards Taiwan, which is as far from the Chinese main right. coast uh, with, uh, as Cuba is from the U.S. main coast. Right. So uh, uh, that part of the report is not untrue. That is a true a, a truth. And, and I think that is the reason that the U.S. officials were so prompt at uh, coming out and refuting that this uh, particular, uh, the entire report is false. Because if you see, as you rightly pointed out, earlier uh, uh, U.S. was quite, U.S. Biden administration was quite prompt of, uh, uh, in reacting to the, the false news of spy balloons, uh, the false uh, news of Havana syndrome, right. and that led to uh, hundreds of sanctions, fresh sanctions being imposed on Cuba. So uh, they usually do not react the way they reacted to this particular report, uh, and that though it is a welcome step, but uh, I, uh, on the lighter side of it, it is primarily emerging because of the acknowledgement in the report that U.S. is also responsible for uh, strategically and militarily s surrounding China uh, in its reach. Right, Abdul. Now, let's talk about Cuba, actually. You know, the question of sanctions has been raised in media reports in the past, but now we're talking about spying, so the sanction question gets hidden. Mm. Is that really the agenda here? Of course. Uh, U.S. has been, uh, as, as I said before, uh, kind of creating, inventing excuses to basically impose fresh sanctions against uh, Cuba. Of course, uh, uh, the differences between Cuba and U.S. is, of course, ideological uh, uh, differences. The economic uh, perspective which Cuban state has is completely opposed to the capitalist neoliberal agenda which the U.S. follows. And not only now, it, even since uh, ever since 1959, when the Cuban Revolution happened, Cuba is under severe uh, blockade and sanctions imposed by U.S. primarily because it does not want uh, that particular uh, understanding of economic uh, uh, relations in society to kind of become 
more influential in the US right. politics. So they, they have been inventing excuses after excuses since 1959 to kind of strengthen their blockade against Cuba, make it uh, uh, kind of uh, look like a failure, make, it, make its econo economy and its people suffer. So uh, as I, ref I was referring to the Havana syndrome, uh, which was a completely fabricated uh, set of allegations uh, claiming that uh, there is a, a kind of medical uh, Absolutely. Uh, 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 you fall sick and exactly you know, yeah, and yeah. that is basically done by the Cubans to basically uh, uh, kind of attack the US it is like the cold war mentality mm -hmm. which has which basically shaped the uh, the US uh, uh, citizenries uh, in particular way a particular thinking Russians are coming so here, here Cubans are the victim and this has been basically the, uh, on the, the serious side of it, this has led to a massive suffering for the people, uh, Cuban people. Uh, as I said before, thousands of uh, sanctions have been imposed, restrictions have been imposed, blockade has been continued, and it is legitimized on the basis of these false uh, allegations invented one after the another. Right, Abdul. Thanks a lot for joining us today. We all know highly processed foods are not good for anyone, especially not for children. But a new report by the First Steps Nutrition Trust in the United Kingdom says more and more infants and very young children are dependent on these kinds of unhealthy foods. And sugar is enemy number one for a lot of people too. But food and sugar alternatives are still being pushed very hard by the processed food industry and governments doing very little to ensure everybody can afford to cook fresh food at home. Anna from the People's Health Movement looks at the report and why fresh food is hard to access for many in the UK and beyond. Anna, great to have you join us. Uh, Another report in the United Kingdom basically shows a very dire picture for what people are eating, what young people are eating. Can you just walk us through some of the basic details in the report and also about sugar in particular, you know, because sugar seems to be the enemy of a lot of people who are trying to lose weight and trying to, you know, avoid diabetes. Now it seems it doesn't work, does it? Uh, yes, so it's... Um... Overall, I would say that, you know, it's uh, the part of uh, of the same discussion that's picking up a bit, uh, that has been picking up a bit uh, in the late, uh, in the last weeks. Um, overall concerning uh, ultra processed, processed foods. So it's, uh, you know, this uh, whole category of foods uh, which are, uh, which go through a very complex industrial process to be produced uh, and they essentially lose the quality of, uh, of the food that we would actually need. Uh, according to uh, according to researchers from Brazil uh, who have come up with this classification and with this designation of uh, ultra processed foods, it's the category of food that we should be consuming the least. Uh, but what we see from this uh, latest report in the UK is that actually uh, this isn't true in most cases. Uh, it's something that we have known from before. Uh, but in this case, it's particularly striking because it concerns very young, pe uh, very young people. So it concern concerns infants, it concerns children uh, of uh, preschool age. So, you know, th this kind of report shows that in the UK, um, it should be noted also in this context that the UK has a very strong formula consuming uh, culture. So it's, uh, it, it has a very high percentage of, uh, of families who resort to, to infant formula instead of breastfeeding, um, which of course uh, means that uh, there, is al uh, there is always uh, families who cannot uh, who cannot breastfeed for numerous reasons. But it's also true that uh, it's, we can imagine that a very high percentage of this uh, this number of families uh, actually lacks the support to introduce breastfeeding, and uh, by doing so, also to increase uh, the chances of uh, of children continuing uh, on a healthy diet uh, further in their lives. So, essentially, to come back to the report, the report shows uh, that uh, many many children uh, in uh, in the United Kingdom resort. Uh, there um, are fed uh, processed foods, so these include, you know, the um, in, include snacks, 
like uh, puffs or uh, fruit bars or uh, food like that. Uh, but they are also uh, these also include uh, the fruit juices. They are uh, often marketed as uh, you know um, allowing children to consume the uh, the amount of uh, of uh, fruit and vegetables that they're supposed to uh, to consume every day. And so you know um, I think the report is uh, important because it shows different it shows different categories. Uh, of, actually different factors that influence parents at this point in time uh, in the United Kingdom. So, you know, uh, on the one hand, it shows how uh, the aggressive marketing of uh, of the food industry uh, affects their choices they make. So, you know, it's uh, it's made very clear by the uh, or it's insinuated by the by the food producers that, you know, choosing a ready made meal uh, is healthy and that it's uh, it will allow um, the parents to feed their child uh, child well uh, while avoiding all the time uh, and cost uh, implications that preparing food would mean. On the other hand, of course, they're faced with this uh, unrelentless um, cost of living crisis, which means that you know food is becoming less and less and less acceptable. So uh, this. Again, uh, can be illustrated also through formula prices, which have risen uh, in the UK since January 2020. Um, and essentially what they are seeing now is that uh, the, the government mechanisms uh, that should allow uh, poor and vulnerable families to access formula and good quality food, uh, they cannot do so because the, uh, the amount uh, programmed by the uh, by the UK government is actually not enough to meet the the prices that are uh, seeing uh, seeing in, in the stores so it's a, it's a complex picture of course it's always a complex picture picture uh, but essentially it's very worrying because it shows that these trends are not uh, not changing and they're actually becoming i would say even even more worrisome than they were before yeah, uh, Anna, and about the sugar bit, you know, the, the sugar is seen as a great danger and, you know, you have all these replacements and alternatives which are not sugar. What are the reports, uh, especially the WHO, it has now said that you should not use the NSS, the so-called NSS? Uh, that's true. So uh, essentially, this was one of the um, uh, of the guidance that has come out after the World Health Assembly in May. Uh, and essentially, what it warns against is, uh, you know, the um, the use of artificial sweeteners instead of sugar uh, when people are uh, trying to uh, to lose weight or uh, for you know for for improving their health overall. So what the WHO is saying is that you know there's not not really um, that it, it doesn't work that way. It's all uh, it's also something that we can see in the UK report is that actually you know uh, this whole story about um, avoiding uh, natural fat and natural uh, natural sugar in food by uh, replacing them with um, with something else. Or when companies say we're not using sugar, but we're using something else, and it's uh, it uh, it's better for you, it's better for a child. It's actually misleading. Um, and again, the the UK report, uh, something that's somewhat mirrored in the WHO guidelines, is that you know this kind of artificial sweeteners uh, actually also have uh, a very bad Im impact on can can have a very bad impact on people's health. Um, for example. Um, the UK study that um, that led to this report showed that uh, a very high percentage of children, young children, consume uh, diet diet drinks, so soft right. drinks, like you know, it's supposed to be no, non sugary or alternatives to to sugary drinks. Uh, they also consume. Uh, in, at, from a very early age, uh, they also consume sugar drinks. But what this leads to is to actually shaping their uh, their habits. Uh, and so when they're introduced to this kind of food and drink at, a, at such an early age, they're more, more likely to consume it uh, later in life. So that means that, you know, uh, uh, later in life, they're also going to increase the it's going to increase the risk of them uh, contracting any kind of non-communicable disease, uh, and it's actually going to to limit 
the space that there is for people to actually uh, consume food, which is good for them. So that's, right, Anna. Uh, yeah. And now, you know, just very quickly, uh, if you're healthy, and it's sort of like a home truth that a fresh home cooked meal made in a hygienic environment for a healthy person of any age is actually the ideal. Do any of the reports emphasize on that? Uh, I think they all emphasize on that. Uh, but what they also emphasize on is that, you know, um, at this moment, most people are aware that there are several factors limiting the, the space for people to actually cook their food, prepare their food in that, that environment. So it's not, um, it's not done uh, in a patronizing way to say to people, to families that, you know, you're cooking uh, in the wrong way, you're feeding your child the wrong way. Uh, again, as I said, it's very, very important to underline that there are people who cannot breastfeed and therefore infant formula has to be there. It has to be present. But on the other hand, there are um, a, there's a, a list of things that governments can do to actually uh, improve the chances of people being able to access food, uh, good quality food and to have time to prepare it. Um, and just so because we were talking about the UK until now, maybe to stay there, uh, you know, um, the, the list of factors that impact the quality of uh, food uh, consumption among children in the UK is also very related to, you know, how much time their parents have outside of work to prepare the meals. Uh, it has, again, uh, a lot to do with uh, the rising prices of food. So pri uh, the, the inflation among food prices in the UK is actually even higher than the general uh, inflation. So it's uh, very difficult for people to actually buy food and then to Absolutely. have time to, to prepare it. The same goes for uh, health environments, which would nurture breastfeeding, which would allow people the time to take off to breastfeed and to actually continue breastfeeding until the child is, uh, is, uh, is one or older. Right, Anna, thanks for uh, joining us and thanks for also pointing out the systemic issues that need to be taken care of before any of these things can happen. Thanks a lot. And that's all we have for today. Thank you very much for watching Daily Debrief. We'll see you again on Saturday. And as always, many more stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel have our regular updates. And this show, Daily Debrief.